to the Plugged In Podcast, a new project from the Institute for Energy Research. To find out more about our work, visit our website at instituteforenergyresearch.org. Welcome to the Plugged In Podcast. I'm Alex Stevens. Joining me today to discuss the Green New Deal is Stephen F. Hayward. Dr. Hayward is a senior resident scholar at the Institute of Governmental Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He writes frequently on current topics, including environmentalism, law, economics, and public policy for a wide range of popular publications, and he's a contributor to the Powerline blog. Dr. Hayward, thanks for taking the time to talk today. Well, it's great to join you guys. You've often said uh, the environment is too important to be left to the environmentalists, and I've I've seen you quoted as saying this in a bunch (laughs) of different places. Uh, What exactly do you mean by that? (laughs) <laughs> well, partly I mean it as a provocation to environmentalists, but there's a serious part to all that, which is, uh, uh, you know, if, if you just step back and were the person from Mars parachuted to Earth, you would think that um, conservation, which sounds like conservative, right, same root word, would be um, a conservative or, a, a, a you know, an enthusiasm that anybody could share. But environmentalism, you know, 40 years ago or more took a decided turn hard to the ideological left where it's been stuck ever since. Uh, and, uh, and, and you know, most of the environmental solutions involve, uh, you know, more political control over people and resources. Uh, it, you know, it, the, the joke is that the, the greenies are watermelons, you know, green on the outside, red on the inside. And boy, there's an awful lot to that. And so most of their so-called solutions and policies are counterproductive or ridiculously expensive. And uh, so there's the problem. If you actually want to protect the environment, the environmentalists are the last people who are any good at doing it. So I think we'll probably get into some of that with the Green New Deal here. With the new Congress starting up here, everyone's sort of jockeying to get their uh, pet projects in the limelight. And one of those policy ideas has been a Green New Deal. Before we talk about that, what's the legacy of the actual New Deal? And how does that play into the way that we should think about this proposal? <laughs> yeah, well, another great question. I mean, I, I keep, uh, I'm having a hard time stopping laughing at the idea of a Green New Deal, but the serious points are these. Uh, the first New Deal, uh, you, you know, was very successful politically, right? It helped build the Democratic Party coalition that dominated American politics for two generations and is still very powerful. Uh, But, of course, economic historians are increasingly of the view that it lengthened the Depression. It made the Depression worse. Uh, And so all it really did was have the effect of growing the government and changing our politics in ways that mostly are for the worse. Now, the idea that uh, today we want a Green New Deal for energy shows a couple things. One is uh, um, shows you the exhaustion of liberalism, that if you're looking for a label or something, let's just go back to an old label and slap it on some different idea. So, you know, we have a new deal, let's have a green new deal. Uh, And I imagine that uh, if we, uh, it's not clear what will be in the green new deal, although there's a couple of outlines we can talk about in a moment, but pretty uh, obvious that uh, the green new deal will be no more effective at changing our energy marketplace in a substantial way than the original deal, new deal was in solving the great depression. Uh, And so in an ironic way, uh, it's a fitting parallel (laughs) between the old new deal and the green new deal. I guess I'd say one last thing is, um, you know, there's no specific legislation yet on the table, except there are the goals that have been laid out, which is get rid of all fossil fuels in 11 years by the year 2030. And this is simply a lunatic idea. Uh, And uh, it'll be interesting to see if they actually, uh, the people behind this, uh, actually try to flesh out in some concrete form real legislative language that would reach that goal. And when that happens, I think it'd be a very, I think the politics of it will flip against it instantaneously. I mean, anyone buying a car today really wants to be told that in 11 years, your car will be obsolete and you won't be able to drive it because we won't we won't be allowing people to make and sell gasoline. I mean, that's a lunatic idea. It certainly doesn't seem like something that will be popular amongst voters. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as, as you've said, there aren't uh, really too many tangible proposals that have been put out there yet. Uh, one group called Data for Progress has put out a report that talks about some of the things that you've said, uh, 100% renewable electricity by 2035. Fossil fuel-free transportation by 2050, uh, no waste in a certain amount of time. They want to reforest for 40 million acres of public and private land uh, in a certain amount of time. Um, I know back in 2017, you wrote a paper um, for the Center for uh, the American Experiment, Minnesota, where you looked at their energy policies, which had a lot of lofty goals similar to what is being laid out in the uh uh, in these Green New Deal proposals. Do you want to just talk about what you guys found there and uh, what's going on in Minnesota? 
Well, okay, sure. I mean, Minnesota is a great case study because uh, it's actually a pretty good by geography for wind because, you know, you do have some strong prevailing and fairly predictable winds uh, across the sort of northern Great Plains. It's terrible for solar power because it's under snow so much of right. the year. However, uh, you know, winds aren't uniform all year round. And so here's a funny thing. In Minnesota, uh, the wind power output is lowest, meaning the wind blows the lowest at the two times a year when electricity demand is highest, which is the depths of winter and the peak of summer. In the winter, people are running a lot more electricity for appliances and keeping warm. And in the summer, they're running air conditioning to keep cool. Uh, and so the ironic thing about Minnesota, and I don't know if Minnesota is unique or not, you have to go state by state, is that when their wind power output is low, <laughs> the way they make up for the gap is by turning on their coal-fired power plants. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the object of all these things is to lower our greenhouse gas emissions. And in Minnesota, greenhouse gas emissions from the electricity sector have actually been going up instead of down. And that's precisely because you put in all this wind power, except at peak periods, the wind power doesn't produce enough electricity. So then you turn on and run your coal power, uh, coal power plants longer. Um, now, some of those coal plants are being retired and replaced by natural gas, and that gets you some emissions reductions, but it won't get you to zero. Uh, which is, you know, what the Green New Deal says we have to do. Um, and also keep in mind, I know you guys know this well, is that the electric power sector is only, you know, I, I'm not sure what the number is nationally, but it's only, uh, you know, half or so of our total energy use. The other half is transportation. Maybe it's less than half. But um, and, you know, that uses, uh, um, you know, liquid fuels as opposed to electrons uh, running through wires. And. So even if you talk about decarbonizing the electric grid, uh, you're still not getting your greenhouse gas emissions down anywhere close to zero. Um, and that's why, by the way, the, the real uh, uh, the fanatics for the Green New Deal say, oh, yeah, we're going to get cars, too. We'll all be driving electric cars in 10, 15 years, which is another <laughs> rather dubious idea. And one of the shocking things that uh, you guys talked about in that report, too, was Minnesota used to have a really um, was really competitive in terms of their uh, electricity pricing. They were electricity used to cost about 18 uh, percent less than the national average in the state. Um, and during the time that you guys studied that, that uh, gap was pretty much uh, diminished. Right. Yeah, and now it's above the national average. I mean, it's been slowly creeping up, and uh, you know, there's no really good reason for that except that all these uh, renewable energy technologies, even with their subsidies, turn out to put upward pressure on prices. Uh, and uh, so it's not too bad yet in Minnesota. I mean, they're a little bit above the national average, but they used to be nicely below it. And we'll see if that continues because um, – you know, Minnesota, as I say, it's a really cold place in the winter, and so uh, energy demand is fairly inelastic there. Why do these ideas that of like a grand strategy to combat climate change and to change our energy markets, why do these plans appeal so much to the left? And why do they seem to drag just about every other issue in with them? The, the, uh, these Green New Deal proposals also want to solve, you know, unemployment problems and... What's the, the appeal there? Yeah, well, you know, you don't have to go very far before you find people on the green left saying that, in fact, capitalism is the problem and, uh, you know, changing our energy mix is really the step, the first step to having a whole new political economy. Uh, and even short of the hardcore socialists among them, I think there's this long been this impulse that if you get control of the energy sector, you really do have great control or leverage over the whole economy. Uh, you know, the socialists of the 1940s and 50s, especially in Europe, used to talk about uh, the commanding heights of an economy. And that meant for them banking, steel, transportation. And that's why Britain nationalized all those industries when the socialist government came in in 1945. And so now what you've got is uh, um, people saying, oh, wait a minute, the energy sector is really the commanding heights of the economy. You control that, you control an awful lot because it is a big part of the, of the global economy and the national economy. So how do you see the, uh, these Green New Deal proposals playing out in terms of practical politics? Is this something established Democrats uh, would ever actually go for? Or is it merely sort of upstarts in Congress who are trying to get people excited about them being elected or – people trying to get people excited for a run-up to 2020. Yeah, so uh, I, I think there's two things to be said about it. The first is, uh, you know, there was a big split among the House Democrats as this new Congress came in uh, between, the, you know, the new people like uh, especially the it girl Alexandra uh, Ocasio-Cortez who wanted a special select committee on climate issues 
And then you had, uh, I forget who it was, but the Democrat, the incoming Democratic chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee who said, no way, we run all that through this committee where I'm chairman. So you, you have some political fights within the Democratic Party about who gets control of this. Uh, Cortez and her allies sort of won. They're getting their select committee, except it doesn't actually have real power to write up uh, markup legislation. It's purely to investigate and talk. And that'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, so there's that split to watch. The second thing is, if you go back just 10 years ago now, when the last time the Democrats had a big majority in both houses, they proposed, you may remember, the Waxman-Markey emissions trading plan. And it barely passed the House and did not pass the Senate. And it was a terrible bill. I mean, it, you know, it, it actually would not have done very much at all, but it would have set up an enormous bureaucracy to regulate especially the electricity sector in the country. And they were buying off people left and right with subsidies and giveaways and carve outs and all kinds of nonsense. And the, the Green New Deal, if you take the advocates of it literally, are proposing something much more ambitious than the Waxman-Markey bill. And so I think that if they actually propose something anywhere close to what they say they're after, it will crash and burn pretty quickly in Congress. Um, so returning back to what we were t talking about at the beginning of the episode, uh, you were talking about, you know, the environment's too important to be left to the environmentalists. Um, I've, I've seen you talk elsewhere about what a conservative or libertarian or right of center version of environmentalism would look like. Um, do you mind just giving our audience uh, sort of a framework of what our ideas have to offer people who are concerned about environmental issues? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a big subject. Uh, but first of all, uh, you would want to have a policy bias towards non-centralized, non-regulatory solutions. Or to the extent that you have the, you're open to regulatory solutions, you want them to be ones that use property rights, incentives, uh, and an emphasis on technological development and progress. Ra uh, rather than uh, you know one size fits all, very prescriptive technological solutions coming from the EPA in Washington. Um, and, and then the second thing is you'd want to actually have priority on what the real problems are. Now, it's another long uh, story, but we've made enormous environmental progress in the United States since the 19, early 1970s. Uh, regulation has had some role in that, but really it's been economic growth and technological improvement. And what mostly the regulations did was just make it more expensive. Um, you know, the EPA, I like to say, specializes in billion-dollar solutions to million-dollar problems. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's some areas where we are, there's still a lot of variation in, in the environmental quality, like uh, surface water quality. That's a very localized problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the federal government's been trying to figure out how to extend the Clean Water Act for a long time and hasn't done a very good job of it. There are a lot of gaps in our data. I think we should be for uh, very good monitoring of environmental conditions. Some things we monitor well, some things, especially surface water quality, we monitor very poorly, although we're getting better at it. Um, and above all, uh, I think one way that anybody who's not a, a left-wing greenie is you don't see this as an apocalyptic problem. You know, every environmental problem that comes along, the left says it's the end of the world. It's, you know, how, you know bees are dying out. Uh, the ozone layer is going away and, you know, climate change. And everyone is always, every issue is always defaulted to the end of the world. And the solution they offer is always the same, more political power for government. And so the, the uh, to restate the point in one sentence, a conservative disposition on the environment would reject all that and treat this as a normal problem not as an apocalyptic problem, and not as an excuse for more centralized power. I think that last point about fear is very interesting. I uh, I just got done reading Robert Higgs's uh, Crisis in Leviathan, um, yeah. and, he, and he pretty much details there the history of panic uh, leading to government overreach. Um, so I, I think that's a really important point about climate change that we don't really discuss probably enough is – uh, just look at the history of the way that fear has been used to um, sort of push more bureaucracy, more regulation and things. So a, a lot of these policy ideas are um, designed to subsidize uh, technologies that people think are upstart technologies and things. Uh, where do we actually see most of the innovation coming from and the sort of progress that opponents of a Green New Deal would uh, actually want to see? Yeah, right. So, you know, the, the chatter you hear from environmentalists and the news media, which uh, we mostly don't know any better, is that, oh, look how much the cost of solar power has fallen and look how much better wind power has gotten. And there's some truth to all that. 
But if you really want to look at where energy innovation has taken place in the last 20 years, it's overwhelmingly in fossil fuels. Uh, everyone knows about the uh, uh, the revolution in um, oil and gas exploration from directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing, such that uh, you know we're now the world's the United States is now the world's leading oil producer. Uh, and you know we were told as recently as 10 years ago by the liberals, well we can't drill our way out. You know it's just impossible. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know our proven reserves, which means uh, you know oil that's practically uh, pr uh, practical to extract have gone from about 20 billion barrels 15 years ago up to about 35 billion barrels today. Wow. And really the number is probably much larger than that. And so that's a technology story. Now, that's one that the environmentalists never saw coming. Uh, I think the people who said we can't drill our way out uh, really ought to uh, shut up uh, because they were clearly wrong. Uh, and then uh, uh, on the on the use side, uh, we have seen tremendous improvements in the efficiency of power plants, of, of you know turbines, uh, combined cycle natural gas plants are really good and really cheap. Uh, coal plants, if we build new coal plants, uh, they would actually be better than the ones that uh, the environmentalists hate today. Here's something almost nobody knows, is that uh, China's been building lots and lots of new coal plants. All of them are more efficient uh, and have lower emissions uh, than American coal plants. And so that uh, that's a real embarrassment to us that we're making it impossible to build new coal plants. Um, and, you know, the Chinese are going to pass us by in that regard. Um, so uh, then the last thing is, is um, uh, maybe not the last thing, but one more major point is that the advocates of the Green New Deal, oh, in the last week or two, put out a letter to Congress signed by 625 different environmental groups. I didn't know there were that many, but there are. And they said the Green New Deal has to be 100% renewable energy, no nuclear power, uh, no carbon capture, if you're worried about the you know, emissions angle from traditional fossil fuels. Um, and in other words, they uh, and no natural gas, no fracking. In other words, they're actually against all the things that work. <laughs> um, and so one area where we're still behind, I think, is uh, nuclear innovation, only because um, you know the big companies still want to build the great big old plants that they built in the 70s and 80s. That I don't know. I don't. I don't understand why we can't make this cheaper. Um, but the couple new plants we're trying to build are coming in way over budget. And there's lots and lots of talk and a fair amount of private investment from people like Bill Gates going into seeing if we can't create a new generation of smaller modular nuclear reactors. Uh, there's a a lot of people enthusiastic about thorium reactors. I'm agnostic about all of them, and I don't think they should be subsidized. Uh, but I do think that the uh, regulatory environment and, and other aspects of the policy environment shouldn't be hostile to it. And that's the default setting for environmentalists is they still can't get over their fear of the atom. I think that those are all excellent points, uh, especially when we talk about, you know, regulatory costs on any type of power plant that the money that they end up spending could go into improving their technology, could go into capital improvement things. So. Um, it's a point that's certainly overlooked quite a bit um, when it's discussed uh, in the media and things. Right. My guest today has been Stephen F. Hayward. Professor Hayward, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. It's been great to join you guys. 